Good morning, everybody. This is Rob Bennett with Eco Districts. Welcome to our webinar Wednesday series. Uh, pleased to have you here for our July conversation with Professor Julian Agamon of Tufts University. Um, today's uh, presentation is entitled Just Sustainabilities in Urban Planning and Practice, and really pleased to have Julian, who's a giant in the space of equitable development and urban planning, uh, join us today for a conversation for the next hour on his work. Um, for those of you who are new to Eco Districts, we're really pleased to have you. For those who have been with us for some time, we're pleased to have you again join us in our uh, ongoing webinar series where we introduce people to projects and, and leaders in the uh, urban development and redevelopment space that are really tackling the interstitial issues of climate change, uh, social and racial equity, and resilience. Um, as I mentioned, uh, today we've um, got Julian with us, who's, who's been a, a partner of ours for some time um, at Eco Districts uh, as, part of a, as part of our board, um, as one of our founding board members uh, when we launched the organization in 2013 and 14. Um, I'm Rob Bennett. I'm the founder and CEO of the organization and uh, been really privileged to be part of this organization through our evolution from startup to where we find ourselves now, uh, really working to promote equitable and sustainable development. Um, our institute is funded in part by the JBP Foundation and Kresge Foundation. We're very uh, pleased to have them as part of our um, part of our network of, of, of funders and supporters that have helped um, put eco districts on the ground and help support um, our efforts to promote equitable and sustainable development through um, through our work, including this institute uh, and our AP and certification programs. Um, you know, again, for those of you who don't know us too well, uh, our mission and vision is simple. Uh, it's really to help modernize and to promote uh, an interst interstitial agenda around just and sustainability uh, in our neighborhood development. And we do this primarily through something we call the Ecodistics Protocol. And this protocol is a framework that we've been applying to projects and promoting uh, for the last six years that really puts equity, resilience, and climate action at the center of uh, urban redevelopment and community development, and then helps projects identify comprehensive strategies uh, in the areas of governance and performance to help shape, guide, and ultimately monitor and, and uh, measure uh, impact over time. Uh, we're the only organization that's focused exclusively at this scale of neighborhood and, and district scale development, and our protocol uh, is the sort of framework that we use to uh, promote uh, integral, uh, integrated and comprehensive solutions to uh, community and district scale development. Uh, Julian's been a big part of this work, helping shape the protocol, helping guide our work, uh, and I think you'll see a lot of that in this presentation today. Uh, two of our key principles I wanted to, to highlight um, that are, are fundamental to the work that we do uh, revolve around collaboration. And our work, um, unlike a lot of organizations that focus on sort of downstream solutions and sort of prescriptive solutions in the areas of urban de design and development, um, ours really focuses on the, the partnerships that are needed to create uh, the solutions that we need uh, in neighborhood and community development. And really thinking about the co-design of neighborhood and district scale development. Julian will talk a lot about that because it's the fundamental underpinnings of equitable development, uh, which brings me to the second uh, principle of our work, um, making sure that equity is built into every decision. Um, equity is a very complicated issue obviously um, but it's finally having its day if you will in urban design and planning and development uh, and it's it's incredibly important that as practitioners we really identify and understand how we address equity both in the partnerships that we create but also in the solution strategies and investments that we make to ensure that every dollar that we spend has the ability to better people's lives uh, both um, both today and into the future. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Julian. I'm not gonna go through his bio in any great detail uh, to suggest otherwise that he hasn't been, a, a, you know, he's been a, a major uh, player in the, uh, in the urban development and urban planning space, 
since the, the mid to late 80s, really helping to shape and define what equitable practice in urban planning looks like coming out of an environmental justice background um, in degrees um, in, in uh, botany and environmental science that led ultimately to planning. Julian has been a big voice um, in championing that the urban planning profession really embrace what he calls just sustainability and embraces the, the environmental uh, justice um, 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 paradigm that has been uh, a driver of much of the community-driven change that we're seeing in our cities today. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Julian. Well, thanks, Rob. Thanks for that introduction. And, uh, you know, thank you to Eco Districts, to our sponsors, especially Rob and Teva, who is in the background, who's been much of the logistics support on this. And thank you to all of you, wherever you are in the world. And, Rob, it's not um, Thursday morning, Wednesday morning everywhere. So uh, there are some people, I'm sure, who are tuning in really late at night. And I thank you for that. Uh, just sustainability is in urban planning and practice. I'm going to try and give you in 40, 45 minutes uh, an overview of what I mean by just sustainability and how it relates deeply, I think, to um, not just the problems that we have in urban planning and practice, but some of the, the solutions uh, that we need. And there is no better time now than for us to be talking about uh, some of those solutions. Um, first thing I want to do, and I do this in all of my talks, is to do a land recognition. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Cambridge, Massachusetts, on the land and traditional territory of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people, and I want to pay my respects to their elders, their past, their present, and their future, and I want to commit to a principle of respect and care as a part of this meeting. I also want to acknowledge that this year we have seen some horrific uh, sides of, of, of human nature, but we've also seen some incredible caring and coming together as a result of what we have seen. And uh, I think eight minutes and 46 seconds that shocked the world has really um, provided us with a watershed to think more deeply about how we relate to place, space and each other. Let me give you a little bit of history about just sustainability. And uh, for those of you who might be wondering uh, why is he shown two of his own books, I'm not trying to sell my books. I'm trying to give you uh, a historical perspective here. This book came out in uh, 2003, 2002, and it was the first book really to look explicitly, centrally at social justice and equity within the sustainability paradigm. At the time that we wrote this book, there was what I called an equity deficit in much sustainability thinking. It was about the environment. And if it led to more socially just and equitable outcomes, that was good. But nobody was centering uh, social justice and equity until we brought this book out, Just Sustainability's Development in an Unequal World. And really in focusing explicitly on equity and justice, <clears throat> on the links between environmental quality and human equality, we were arguing that sustainability isn't simply a green or environmental concern, but we acknowledge the importance of that. We said that a truly sustainable society is one where wider questions of social need and welfare, economic opportunity, are integrally related to environmental limits. And that was really key. That differentiated this emerging just sustainability paradigm from much of the equity deficit related environmental thinking that was going on at the time. But it was, and this is, <laughs> I don't usually advertise other people's books, but if there is one book that I would recommend that you read, it is this very readable book by two British academics, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. Here's the bottom line. They looked at data from around the world for the last 40 years, um, and they came to a very stunning conclusion. It's not poverty that is killing us, it's inequality. It's the gap between rich and poor. And they showed that on every level, on every social factor, from teen pregnancies to underachievement, from 
incarceration to domestic violence, from drug abuse uh, to whatever you want to think of, inequality uh, increased the, uh, the severity of that problem. Now, what was really interesting as well was that they found that countries with the highest levels of inequality <clears throat> also had something very strange. They had the highest levels of advertising revenue. Advertisers love inequality. Inequality sells because everybody's trying to get to the next level. Everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses. Everybody's trying to move up to the next level, whether it's the poor into the middle class or it's the rich into the super rich. But the other thing that's really interesting is that inequality also heightens competitive consumption, which heightens our carbon footprint. So there's an argument made in the book that if we want to lower carbon footprints, if we want to mitigate against climate change, then we need to reduce inequality. And I find this fascinating because when I look at a lot of these great organizations doing great work on climate change, very few of them are mentioning inequality. They're all talking about sustainable agriculture, sustainable transportation. These are solutions. Let's look at the some of the causes of climate change which can be related to uh, inequality. So I mentioned that because if we really want to understand sustainability, we should focus on both human equality and environmental quality together. I challenge you, look around the world, look at where environmental degradation is happening. And it's almost always happening in relation to human rights and social justice abuses, whether it's the Brazilian Amazon, the Niger Delta in Nigeria, whether it's, uh, you know, ex exploration, oil exploration in Siberia, it doesn't matter where. Environmental degradation on a large scale relates to and uh, in many ways needs human rights abuses and uh, social justice abuses. So how am I going to define just sustainability? It is the need to ensure a better quality of life for all now and into the future in a just and equitable manner whilst living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. And in that there are four conditions. We must commit to improving our quality of life and well-being. We must meet the needs of both present and future generations. We need intra and intergenerational equity. We must center justice and equity in terms of recognition, process, procedure, and outcome. And I just want to dwell on this uh, a while. Many of the traditional environmental justice formulations have been about getting the processes and procedures right, making sure that everybody has access to justice. But really over the last 10 or 15 years, the concept of recognition has become, I think, very important, and no more so than at the moment. And the greatest cry in this world for recognition is the Black Lives Matter movement, Me Too movements. So recognition is, I think, a precursor to justice. If we don't recognize the rights to be of certain groups in society, how can we ever do justice by them, with them, and for them? So I'm gonna talk more about recognition as we, uh, as we go through this webinar. Um, the final is uh, living within ecosystem limits. It's not the final one for any other reason than uh, I put it as number four, but living within ecosystem limits, the, um, the ecosystems that we live within, the planet uh, is our umbilical cord. There is no plan B, there is no planet B. We have to make this one work in the most socially just and equitable manner. Now, before I go into giving you some examples, I just want to give you a few thoughts about urban planning. One of the best definitions, SNAP definitions that I know of, is Emeritus Professor Patsy Healy of Newcastle University in the UK, who said urban planning is managing our coexistence in shared space. Two words I want you to remember, coexistence and shared space. Leonie Sandercock from UBC adds to this and says, this speaks with equal clarity about environmental tra transport, housing and other conflicts, reminding us that whether we like it or not, we share space on the planet with others who in many ways are not like us. And we need to find ways of coexisting in these spaces uh, from the neighborhood, from the next door to the street, to the neighborhood, to the city, to the region. It would be easy in many ways to plan if everybody was the same, but we're not. We increasingly live in cities of difference, cities where we come into contact with the other. 
how do we plan for cities of difference? How do we do that in a way that is productive and uses difference, not as some kind of fear and threat, but as a way of um, both celebrating and centering the, the, the human spirit? And the second thought I want to give you is something that I've been working on a lot at the moment, is what is the relationship between belonging and becoming? Now, urban planners, we're really good at saying what cities can become. They can become smart, sharing, resilient, sustainable. But the corollary of this is who gets to belong in the city? Issues of recognition, reconciliation, difference, diversity, inclusion. As planners, we are almost trained to, to uh, really focus on the city of becoming, not the city of belonging. And I really want us to have much more of a balance. Let's not stop dreaming. We need to dream about what we can become. That's, that's deep in the DNA of planning, but also deep in the DNA, but it's been buried, is the city of belonging. Who gets to belong? And I'm going to talk more again about that. I also want to say that just sustainability is, is I think, about humane scaled planning as opposed to solely human scaled planning. And just sustainability helps us think, I think, through all of these issues, coexistence, shared space, belonging, becoming humane and human. We need to think critically about all of these issues. So I want to give you three examples. Um, and for those of you who've seen me present before, and I'm sure there's a few of you out there, I've put in an, uh, a, a new uh, issue that I've been thinking about, and that is about Minneapolis. But I'm going to talk to you about spatial justice. How do we allocate rights in urban spaces and places? I want to talk about Minneapolis. How does one of the most liberal cities in the uh, US end up as the epicenter of our current introspection over structural racism? And then I want to finish by talking a bit about food justice and ask, I think, a very poignant question. What is local food in intercultural societies? So spatial justice, let's start out there. Uh, social justice requires that life chances are not distributed along class lines. Spatial justice says chance, opportunity, life expectancy should not be distributed geographically. We have cities with walls. But we also have cities where there are no walls, but there are railway tracks, freeways, uh, a creek, a river. And on one side, they live, and on the other side, you live. And we have these markers in cities that differentiate, and we have cities that are spatially uh, unjust. Most of our cities are spatially unjust. We do fortunately have in geography one of the most powerful tools since the map, which is geographic information systems, which can uncover for us spatial injustices and inequities. But let me give you an example. Um, the most common public space we use, the, the street. Look at those two streets, one in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the other one in Gothenburg, Sweden. They're exactly the same width, but they couldn't look more dissimilar. On the left, Sodrevegan has been democratized. Spatial justice has been imposed on that street such that private vehicles can only go on the part of the street to the left of the streetcar. And there are none of them because people are walking, cycling, or in streetcars. In Massachusetts, the principle of allocation, or in the US, the principle of allocation of space is the size of your vehicle. The bigger your vehicle, the more space you can get. Think about this. What happens to the kid who lives in one of the apartments overlooking that road? What does the kid think every day as he, she, they go out into the street and see spatial justice and democratized streetscape on the left and organized chaos, let's call it that, on the, on the right? How does the kid get wired differently? Now, there is data to, to, to really look into uh, how this works. We have um, work from uh, Don Appleyard, which looks at social interactions on streets. The lightly trafficked street on the right has much more social interaction and social, um, well, social interaction friendships than the heavily trafficked street. What's the just sustainability's take on this? 
Who lives on the heavily trafficked streets? Who lives on heavily trafficked streets? It's, it's largely poor and low income and uh, minority uh, people. So we can see here that issues of spatial justice can be extended down to the street level. And we can also see here that the idea of complete streets, which I'll go on to talk about, complete streets are in many ways uh, a privilege for these lightly trafficked streets. Not everybody can afford to live on lightly trafficked streets. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, in, in a few minutes. We can do this in the US. We can change. Um, the Bloomberg administration, uh, not that I agree with everything Mayor Bloomberg did, but he hired a brilliant transportation commissioner, uh, Janet Sadiq Khan. They brought in Jan Gale from Copenhagen. They engaged the uh, transportation justice, mobility justice groups. And the picture on the bottom right is what you see today uh, outside of Macy's on Broadway. This also says something to me, urban planning is about what is possible, not what is probable. If we keep doing what we've probably always done, we won't get out of this tired old um, supremacist paradigm. We will be stuck in it. We need to think about what is possible. Good examples here of spatial injustice in terms of hostile and defensive architecture. We tell people they don't belong. You're poor, you're homeless, you don't belong. You're a teenage skateboarder, you can't skate along that ridge along the top of the, uh, uh, on the top left picture. If you're poor and you happen to live in an apartment building that has a required uh, 10 or 20 or 15 percent affordable housing you you might in some cities go in through a back alley rather than through the rich door at the front on the on the boulevard some very interesting work by a friend of mine elijah anderson at yale he talks about the cosmopolitan canopy his point is most of the time we walk down streets and those streets uh, are full of people and we avoid eye contact. But he says there are certain spaces in cities called cosmopolitan canopies. <clears throat> and his example here is Philadelphia's Reading Terminal Market, where people are much more civil. They talk. They talk around food. They talk about some sports that are on the TV. People let down their guard. And one question I have for us, is there a role for planning and planners and urban designers in creating cosmopolitan canopies? Now, don't get me wrong and don't get Elijah wrong. We're not saying that cosmopolitan canopies will erase racism, not the case at all. But cosmopolitan canopies, I think, show that contact theory works. Contact theory says the more contact we have with people who are different, the more likely we are to be tolerant and even accepting of pro, uh, I don't want to use the word assimilation or integration, but pro uh, progressive policies, if you like. How do we do that? How do we, uh, can we, as urban planners and designers, can we seed cosmopolitan canopies? Because these are useful places, I think, to just get people mixing across difference, meeting the other. Now, a really common way of trying to get over um, spatially unjust streets is the so-called complete streets movement very common across uh, North America. And here I've shown you some examples from Toronto, Somerville, Massachusetts, where Tufts University is, Swampscott, Massachusetts, Massachusetts uh, Department of Transportation, the state. Everybody should agree with complete streets. They are a good idea, but they have certain problems. They are intended to counteract uh, car-centric planning. But they come with a, a wide range of problems, which I think some people are choosing to ignore because it's sustainable to have these complete streets. But will they result in enhanced livability only for the most privileged residents? Well, I think that's very fast and sadly becoming the case. So let's ask what a complete street is. Um, on the right, the picture shows an urban designer's idea of, you know, a plan for a complete street. On the left is i think a, a brilliant complete street it was never intended to be like that but the social ecology of the picture on the left shows that humans can develop and adapt these spaces called streets to more humane and um, social purposes and i'm taking a lead here from uh, 
the late Doreen Massey, a geographer, who says that places, and I see streets as places, are constantly shifting articulations of social relations through time. So streets are not simply physical spaces, they are social spaces. And because the Complete Streets movement is largely run by urban designers, the rhetoric of Complete Streets disconnects the street from the significant social, structural, symbolic, discursive and historical realities. And we have cities like LA, Los Angeles, believe it or not, the you know, car metropolis, it has a Complete Streets policy, but guess what? Until very recently, they banned street traders. Now, for those of you who know LA, and for those of you who know Latino and Southeast Asian culture, street food, street trading is a cultural icon. It's a cultural necessity. How could a city say we have a complete streets policy when until very recently they banned complete street? Uh, sorry, they banned uh, street traders. They have since release that policy and that's a good thing but it shows you it takes critical thinking to really uh, get underneath some of these design-led concepts that have very very disproportionate outcomes for certain groups and in this case latino and uh, sorry latinx and um and southeast asians one of the big dangers of complete streets is what's called greenlining and gentrification. And these books are from a series that I edit. Um, one of the big problems, I think, is that we notice that neighborhoods that have undergone complete streets treatment tend to be neighborhoods where rents go up, house prices go up, and many of these narratives of complete streets are systematically reproducing many of the urban, spatial and social inequalities and injustices that have characterized North American cities uh, for the last century or more. Redlining was explicitly racist. Greenlining is not explicitly racist, but it has the similar effect. In fact, in the book Green Gentrification on your right there, they talk about, um, you know, greenlining as, as making white spaces so if you look at these sustainable green complete streets neighborhoods they are uh, disproportionately white uh, and upper middle class and let's think about walk score one of the key metrics of sustainable neighborhoods is walkability and walk score is the uh, app that measures the walkability of the neighborhood from zero to 100 uh, you see on the arrow I've put walk score is now part of Redfin. For those of you who are not in the United States, Redfin is one of the largest real estate companies. Let's just take a breather here. Um, a real estate company owns an app for walkability. We've conflated sustainability with real estate. We have conflated or we have degraded sustainability such that it has now become something we buy or sell. I want walkable neighborhoods for everybody. I don't just want people to get into walkable neighborhoods because they can afford to. So again, there's a challenge, um, a just sustainability challenge to current urban planning, which is obsessed with the idea of complete streets. We can think of spatial justice in terms of urban parks. Um, Low, Taplin and Sheld noted that, um, you know, in this century, we're not facing um, a, a disuse problem with open space. In fact, far from it. What we're finding is that patterns of design and management tend to exclude some people and reduce social and cultural diversity. I'd go further. I think it's parks design, management and programming that can be exclusive. How do we change that? What we need is more parks designers and managers and programmers who are from the communities that the parks are in and that generally isn't the case certainly uh, in, in in the united states at the moment and again why do we need urban parks why do we need good public spaces we need contact we need people to meet and to talk across difference in our public spaces any hope of the intercultural city needs proactive thinking on design, management and programming of public space. A really excellent piece of work in the uh, early 2000s by Lanfer and Taylor looked at 
Boston and how the new immigrants to Boston may well, and it may well happen sooner rather than later, may well make up the political um, scene in Boston. But what about some of these old organizations, the Friends of the Park? How will the new politics of a majority minority city like Boston now, how will that sit with people who have very old ideas about public spaces? Um, and these Friends of the Park type organizations tend to be uh, very white and uh, uh, slightly older than the, <laughs> the average population. Something to think about there, immigrant engagement in public space. How do we engage new immigrants in public spaces? And one interesting um, idea that the, they come up with um, is this idea of landscape linking, that certain immigrants gravitate to certain spaces. And the quote here from a Guatemalan American, I think is instructive. I think one of the reasons that that place is so popular with us Latinos is because of the willows. Willows in Guatemala are very common. They grow beside rivers. People like Herta Park in Boston because it looks like home. Maybe there is a, an idea here. Maybe we can start thinking about linking landscapes as a way of um, engaging and making people feel, helping people to feel that they belong. In Copenhagen, they tried a different way. They designed in Encounter in Superkeelan Park in the Norabra district, which is a hugely multicultural district. Don't think that some of these Nordic countries are entirely white uh, and, and tall, blonde haired people. Um, you go to Copenhagen, Stockholm, Reykjavik, uh, you go to Helsinki, very diverse uh, cities nowadays. And so the idea at Superkeelan was to try and design in diversity by putting in artifacts from different countries where people in the local community live. And it seems to work in many ways. I also feel that if we are to, to um, you know, to increase the feeling of engagement and belonging amongst uh, newer immigrants, especially, we need deep ethnographies. Let's get rid of the design charrettes. Let's go for deep ethnographies. And my friends at the Department of Landscape at the University of Sheffield, uh, shout out to Claire Rishbeth and her colleagues, uh, have formed the Transnational Urban Outdoors Research Group. They've developed resource packs on refugees uh, and parks. They've developed an article which I urge you to read in the journal that I edit called Ethnographic Understandings of Ethnically Diverse Neighbourhoods to Inform Urban Design Practice. No planner or urban designer can say, I don't know what to do. There is plenty of research going on. Maybe we need as academics to make a, a better link with practice, but that's uh, maybe a, a topic for discussion. Okay, my second piece is something I've become increasingly fascinated with, and that's Minneapolis. Uh, it's a green utopia, folks, didn't you know that? It's the best park city system in the US. It's one of the best cities in the US for exercise. It's the third best city for bike commuters. It's a miracle. Minneapolis mixes affordability, opportunity and wealth if you're white. Racial inequality in Minneapolis is among the worst in the nation. The black-white income gap is the largest in the nation. The black-white home ownership gap, which is essentially what's called the wealth gap, is the largest in the nation. And the um, opportunity gap, um, which is sometimes called erroneously called the achievement gap, the opportunity gap is huge for Native American um, uh, and uh, African American and Hispanic, uh, sorry, and Latinx people, between 20 and 30 points um, uh, is the gap. So, what is Minneapolis? Is it an example of unjust sustainability? Well, I think it is. Why is this the case then? Why have we got these two Minneapolises? Why is there a green utopia underlying a racist hell? Well, this is where urban planning comes in. and. Kirsten Delagarde, a historian in, in Minneapolis and founder of an excellent project called Mapping Prejudice, says that all that civic rhetoric about Minneapolis being a model metropolis at the cutting edge of great urban planning obscures uh, some darker truths about the city. 
And what are those darker truths? Well, they found as a result of this project that Minneapolis was not always segregated, but from the early 90s to the 1960s, there were some horrifically racialized covenants and the language of which is, is appalling. Uh, but if you go online, you can find examples of these and they existed until the, the Fair Housing Act of, of, of 1968. And they probably existed longer than that um, in terms of um, word of mouth, but they were technically illegal. So when you get racialized covenants plus exclusionary or single family zoning, which made up a massive 70% or makes up a massive 70% of residential land in, um, in Minneapolis. Comparison, uh, New York has about 15% uh, zoning for single families. And then you add redlining to that, what do you get? You get racial segregation then and now. Also, what was very interesting I found in my research is that many of these much vaunted parks in Minneapolis have what's called a racial cordon around them that zoning was deliberately uh, single family to protect uh, access to parks, uh, et cetera. So we have a deeply divided city, albeit a very progressive and supposedly liberal city, that is deeply segregated then and it's deeply segregated now. So what now? Um, I have to give a shout out in many ways to Jacob Frey, the, um, the mayor, to uh, many of the, um, the state senators and representatives and to the city council that really recognizes change has to come. And Heather Worthington, the director of long range planning says, there's a direct linkage between those practices in the late 19th and 20, early 20th century and today's modern zoning plans. Part of the impetus for changing how we view land use is to try and undo those impacts. I put it, but slightly differently, I say urban planning is the spatial toolkit for articulating, implementing, and maintaining white supremacy. And we can do something about it. So what is Minneapolis doing? Well, in 2018, Minneapolis became the first large US city to vote to end single family zoning, allowing uh, for duplexes and triplexes. For those of you who are urban planners, this is what's called upzoning. Um, there's a, a package of reforms, inclusionary zoning, which requires new apartment projects to include 10% um, of units for moderate income households. So I've just put here two of the goals, eliminate disparities and affordable and accessible, uh, accessible housing. Minneapolis, the city is doing uh, more than many other cities, more than many other cities. Um, but we have to remember, um, but 94% of Minneapolis police force doesn't live in Minneapolis. They live in the suburbs. That's a problem. Uh, here in Boston, um, there's a residency requirement. If you're a Boston teacher or police officer, you have to live in the city. Does that make it perfect? No. But it means that that cop that's walking around probably went to school with or knows your brother, your uncle, somebody like that. There is an element of social connection. There was no element of so there is no element of social connection as far as I can see uh, in the Minneapolis police force. And this I think brings a bigger point for me. Unless the organization you work for, nonprofit, government, etc., looks like the community, are you legitimate? Are you effective? Are you trusted? Can you even do your job? I think organiz organizations need to look like the communities um, that they that they uh, are in. And I want to give a shout out here to um, a fabulous organization in Boston, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. In the early 1980s, when they set up, they were um, they did a demographic survey of the neighborhood and they constituted the board of directors to look like the neighborhood. Consequently, for 40 years now, they've been practicing and they are loved by funders, they are trusted, they are legitimate, they are effective in what they do. And what do they do? They've got community land trusts with urban farms, they've developed affordable housing, um, they've developed the Dudley Commons. It, it's a, an amazing organization and I urge you to go to dsni.org to check them out. Okay, my final uh, five or ten minutes, I want to just talk to you uh, about food justice and uh, 
for those of you who are interested in food, this is my book here with Alison Alcon, Cultivating Food Justice, Race, Class and Sustainability. No pressure to buy, folks. But apparently, if I leave this slide on for 45 seconds, the psychologists tell me 20% of you will go to Amazon or your local bookstore and buy this book. So my question then was, what are local foods in intercultural societies? And uh, the picture below, I think, tells part of the story. Here's George and Julia Bowling, the late George uh, and Julia Bowling, tobacco farmers in Maryland in the US. The state of Maryland for the last 20 years has been trying to get people out of tobacco farming. George and Julia, being good American entrepreneurs, were thinking, well, how can we diversify? And they start thinking about the 120,000 Africans that are living in the Washington DC uh, metroplex, which is adjacent to, to Maryland. Um, and they started thinking about this and they started doing some research and the University of Maryland Extension Program produced a, a document on growing African crops in Maryland. Consequently now, the signboard to the farm that George and Julia <clears throat> operate says African produce. They are selling African produce to Africans who drive out from the DC area to come and um, pick and take uh, produce. So what are local foods? If the Africans want to eat African produce, is, is that local food? I find that many people in the alternative food movement will tell you what should be grown locally in terms of sort of, you know, ecological ideas. But that's not necessarily what our increasingly diverse urban populations want to buy uh, locally as culturally appropriate foods. And it's not just um, the Africans, uh, the Filipinos in San Diego demonstrate what's been called translocalism. They bring their Filipino local with them to San Diego. How does that work? In interviews, Filipinos were asked, what is local food? And they said, well, it's the food we eat. It's the food we eat in our restaurants. It's the food we grow in our yards. So this idea of translocalism, I think, is useful. It takes away the gaze from local as a geographic fixed notion. And I'm a geographer. There is no such thing as local. Local is what I can persuade you is local. And I'm not going to try and persuade you what local is. So there is no fixed notion of local, but there is a more cultural or relativist notion of local. And I think this idea of translocalism helps us. And I think if the alternative food movement had a more reflexive um, idea of what local was, we would build a bigger movement for alternative food rather than having the alternative food movement as it is at the moment being largely white and middle and upper middle class. For those of you in Canada, um, have a guess how many farmers in Metro Vancouver are Chinese Canadians. Nearly 20% of farmers in the Metro Vancouver region are Chinese Canadians. And they don't use farmers markets. Now, when you think about it, local food and farmers markets are two of the, the icons, two of the foundational pillars of the alternative food movement. And yet Chinese Canadian uh, farmers in the Vancouver region, they don't use farmers markets. They have their own parallel network of markets. And I was giving this same talk to uh, a group in Vancouver and a young African woman who recently moved to Vancouver said, you know, Julian, I shop at the Chinese markets. They grow the food that I want. I'm just trying to problematize here notions of local, lo notions of choice, notions of what food justice should be thinking about. It's not just about food deserts. And I could talk to you for a long time about food deserts. It's about uh, immigrants. It's about having food choices. It's about um how people can express themselves through food and here we have a picture of uh, two young women at the now sadly defunct um south central farm in la um, these two women are from oaxaca and south central farm in la was the biggest latinx uh, urban farm uh, in the united states and i i always get a chill down the down, down my back when I uh, read this uh, transcript from what they said. 
I planted this garden because it's a little space like home. I grow the same plants that I had in my garden in Oaxaca. We can eat like we ate at home and this makes us feel like ourselves. It allows us to keep a part of who we are after coming to the United States. So they're not only eating culturally appropriate foods, they're growing it in a spatial organization that looks like the garden from home. Immigrants need, whether it's the, uh, the willows in Herta Park in Boston, or whether it's these Oaxacan women in South Central LA, immigrants need a place that is their home in their new home. And in many ways, food is that umbilical link between home and here. Um, there are many urban farms now around the country, and my own university, Tufts University, runs one that is aimed at uh, helping new immigrants to the US to get into farming in, in the US. And there are 50 of these farms. This one is New Roots Farm uh, in San Diego. Final uh, slide is a plug for my latest book, The Immigrant Food Nexus, Borders, Labour and Identity in North America. And this book really looks at immigration in North America from the macro scale of national policy. And let's remember that in US agriculture, 50 to 70 percent of workers are undocumented immigrants. We can't talk about immigration without talking about food and vice versa. And then the second part of the book is about the micro scale of immigrants' lived daily lives and food ways. So if you're interested in immigration, food and just sustainabilities, uh, this would be a book for you. So let me summarise uh, just sustainabilities in urban planning and practice. How do we manage our coexistence in shared space? We need to foster belonging and becoming in cities. We need to foster engagement and belonging using deep ethnographies, deep understandings, and we can co-produce those ethnographies with the communities uh, concerned. We need to engage in intercultural, culturally competent planning and policy making, practicing human scale and humane scale urban planning and design. And above all, I want to leave you with the idea that social justice never simply happens in planning processes and outcomes. It must be uh, intentional, implicit and front and centre uh, in the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, as always, a pleasure to listen to you sort of take a very complicated set of issues and help help make sense of it. And there's a richness to the uh, to your scholarship and a lot of the the references to the the material um, in your presentation. Uh, for those of you on the call, all of this will be shared, uh, and you'll get an email from us with the recording and the slides. Uh, that question was asked. So we've got some questions that I've been monitoring um, throughout your talk, Julian, and I wanted to put a few questions together and try to make it a, a single question because they're, they're uh, these questions uh, refer to the role of the urban planning profession and the pressures uh, and the drivers uh, in which planners are typically responding to the private market and the development interests and ultimately the politicians who set policy uh, and that kind of intersection between power um, in the real estate industry and politicians and how planners ultimately um, activate um, uh, the urban planning agenda for cities. Um, these questions that I'm trying to pull together really are talking about uh, the acceleration of gentrification, that upzoning and density has led to more market housing um, and, uh, and less, uh, as a percentage, less affordable housing during the last 10 years. And ultimately, the planning profession uh, is sort of stuck uh, trying to activate a just sustainability agenda when market conditions are are moving quickly. Can you speak to um, the work that you've done or examples where you see uh, the urban planning profession uh, have a, a, a more rigorous and a more um, muscular approach to sort of guiding and shaping development, um, recognizing these these uh, political and sort of uh, market dimensions are very real and driving a lot of the urbanization yeah. in our cities. Thanks, Rob, and, and great, great set of uh, 
questions. I can only imagine what that collectivity of questions is going to be. And yes, gentrification, you know, is uh, a real, real problem. Uh, even here in Cambridge, you know, with probably the most activist local government in the United States, Cambridge, Massachusetts, <clears throat> you know, with um, Cambridge going above the Massachusetts required minimums for um, affordable housing, we still have gentrification. Look, there's, there's, there's no silver bullet on gentrification. But number one, we need activist planning committees and we need activist urban planners. Uh, it is just as, um, you know, being against racism now is, is, is not enough. You have to be anti-racist. I think, you know, being uh, a sort of a passive urban planner who merely does what we've always done is just not acceptable. We need, um, the activist urban planner. And on, in terms of gentrification, I mean, there's many, many ideas. Um, Dan Immerglock and his colleagues down at uh, Georgia Tech have been studying the Atlanta Beltline. Um, and their conclusion is that before we do any of these, uh, these urban developments, these really cool developments, um, we need a robust um, affordable housing policies before before the projects start. So affordable housing prior to starting some of these, um, these, these, these uh, ideas, these, these uh, developments that could cause gentrification. Second, um, one idea is um, the notion of patient capital. Um, this is the idea that much of the capital that goes into some of these projects is looking for a quick turnover. Um, um, People uh, at McAllister College uh, in, in, in Minneapolis St. Paul are thinking about the idea of patient capital, capital that doesn't need to be in and out so quickly, capital that can be staying in the neighborhoods, capital that can um, that, that can can uh, can be patient, if you like. Um, there's an idea and one of the books that I um, showed you from my book series there, there's an idea called Just Green Enough. In one neighborhood in Brooklyn, they're looking at um, not doing the the full green smear, if you like, but just cleaning up the neighbourhood, almost like a public health cleanup rather than a, an ecological super green cleanup, because they felt that super greening uh, the neighbourhood just leads to uh, gentrification. So there's, I think, there's lots of different models. Community land trusts, um, you know, having land banks and um, finding ways to 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 get land into uh, community uses, but you know ultimately one of the I think best quotes that I heard at a recent conference uh, was from David Harvey, the uh, the the esteemed geographer David Harvey, who said, um, "We're building cities for people to invest in, not to live in, and until we overturn that paradigm." Um, what are we going to do? Um, Berlin, I think only about 18% of people own their own homes in Berlin. Um, you know, is a change in ownership uh, something, because Berlin doesn't, hasn't stopped gentrification, it's still happening in Berlin. So it's a massively complex uh, issue. And I think because there's no silver bullet, each locality has to look at what works best. But, but my, 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 I suppose, my backing would be behind, you know, robust, progressive housing affordability policies um, is, is the best way forward. Is it going to stop gentrification? No, but it, it, it will slow it, I think, quite effectively. Um, but until we have a, a, a political change which sees cities go back to the idea of the city as a as a, as a place to, to live and grow rather than a place to invest purely a place to invest then we're not going to get much change on the gentrification front yeah thank you for that yeah my experience in the in the northwest um and having worked in two cities both canada uh, vancouver canada and portland was recognizing the sort of strength of uh the bureaucracies or the regime the planning regimes and the roles they played in canada where development um, by right isn't allowed and it's a negotiated agenda that provides a different vehicle to create the co-benefits 
the affordable housing and the other sort of amenities development by development where in the US, um, you know, zoning by right um, limits the amount of sort of control that cities have. And in, in high growth markets like New York or Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, et cetera, you know, that the ability to kind of catch up with the market doesn't really exist. It's just over outstripping the regulatory regime. But I think, you know, from my perspective, the intentionality of cities, as you say, uh, putting into into place anti-displacement strategies ahead, um, mapping hotspots for gentrification and displacement, and really being very clear about what the interventions is the is the first step. Uh, thank you for that. Now, um, there's a series of questions sort of associated with uh, the George Floyd killing and the pandemic and the sort of intersection of race justice and you know, health inequities. Um, what are you seeing uh, beyond, you know, police reform that we're seeing sort of sweep sweep uh, throughout many cities in the country in the urban planning profession that res is responding uh, to, you know, these, these sort of seismic shifts that we're seeing in both, in both um, in health outcomes, particularly around, among people of color um, and in the racial justice movement that's taking, uh, uh, taking root. Are you seeing this as uh, fuel for the kind of progressive policies you're talking about? Are you seeing it manifest in the urban planning profession in ways that you haven't? Um, curious about what what you think uh, the sort of the moment is is teaching us and what trends mm -hmm. are happening. Again, a great question. Um, you know, I think we're in the lag time at the moment. I, you know, we've been we've been hit with <laughs> we're only halfway through the year and we've been hit by two world changing uh, crises which, you know, have exposed cruelly what many of us knew as the deep and even deepening inequalities um, in certainly in North America, but also around the world. Um, and at the moment, I think urban planners are, are reeling. Um, and so we're in this lag between how do we respond um, beyond yet more statements of outrage um, and how do we change those? Some of them are really excellent statements of intent, heartfelt statements of intent. How do we move those on into measurable outcomes? Um, you know, if we held some of the organizations that I've collected statements of intent from, if we held them to some of those statements and we developed with them measurable outcomes, we would have some pretty deep, deep, deep changes. Um, the danger for us is that we lose the moment and um you know i one of the best letters and i hope she's on the line but uh, is jay pitter uh, author and uh, urban uh, planner uh, in toronto and she wrote a beautiful um um letter to to urbanists mainly canadian urbanists but i think it works around the world we have to have a moment of humility and a moment to just take stock of what has actually happened and you know and we have to make sure that that eight minutes 46 seconds really does change things and i'm seeing police committees all around uh looking at change i mean this has precipitated some real soul searching how do we maintain that in the in the months and years to come and how do we build on that and how do we um how do we center um you know, issues of black, indigenous and people of color urbanism into what has largely been, as we saw in the Minneapolis example, a white concern. How do we center some of these ideas? I have to say I'm working with a colleague and good friend of mine um, at the University of Wales in Cardiff, uh, Asim Inam. I'm working with him on a, uh, a paper looking at hero urbanists when we think of the urbanists we think of jan gale we think of all of these white often male urbanists what about the urbanists of color that whose voices have been silenced and you know in line with what jay pitter from toronto has been saying i'm thinking you know we really need this moment to to start articulating uh, some of the changes that we want to see uh, in urbanism and in urban planning and the very final thing because i realize we're running out of time the very final thing is we don't have an urban planning or city building set of professions that look like the communities they work in we desperately need that that would give more legitimacy i think it would give more trust more effectiveness and different ways of working 
Well, with that, that was actually my last question, which a young, uh, a young um, person on the call uh, asked the question. As a young BIPOC um, uh, looking to get into urban planning, as a person of color, what do you, what advice do you have when their concern is they'd be entering into a very white profession and, and into white spaces? Right. Well, number one, come and do your master's degree at Tufts, uh, and I will be your mentor. Um, <laughs> genuinely um, and number two I'm saying to my BIPOC uh, graduates this year I think the employment prospects have never been better for you many 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 planning departments are heeding the notion that they need to be more diverse not in a tokenistic way we need a critical mass we need a critical mass of BIPOC uh, urban planners just having one or two, having a critical mass, having a planning department that looks like the community. You remember I said Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative uh, in Boston uh, did a demographic survey and tried to make their organization's board of directors look like the community. Well, how about our planning departments doing that? Now, I'm not guaranteeing that would solve every problem, but it would be a big step towards introducing new creativity new energy and new ideas uh, into urban planning and all of those ideas are around at the moment they just need to be surfaced yeah interesting story coming out of i believe it was out of the washington post about um the the sort of gentr uh, the, the diversification in our rural areas uh, helping drive so much of the black lives matter uh, protests throughout the Midwest and in my city of Portland, 50% of kids are kids of color in the Portland public school system. So to your point, you know, the, the profession um, not only needs to change, it, it has to change to respond to the growing um, sort of diversity in, um, of our cities, um, even the most white cities like Portland. Yeah, one thing as well, Rob, just you know, and again, I'm appreciating people's time, but one really serious thing I think that we should be thinking of, and we're looking at it, is pipelines. How do we develop pipelines for those kids who don't know what planning is about? Or they don't hear about it at school, at high school, or, you know, how do we get those kids uh, excited about changing the way things are? How do we get kids to do that? Um, and there are examples. I think they're doing some stuff in Chicago and some of the planning schools there. Let's start yeah. mainstreaming pipeline uh, to planning. That's great. And I will end there. There's a great piece by the Black uh, Student uh, Association at Columbia University really pressing that school's Department of Planning and Real Estate and, and Design on these issues. And we'll make sure to share that uh, resource with everyone on this call. You Thanks again, Professor Julian Agamon. You might also want to share our Tufts uh, UEP statement on that right. uh, as well. Thanks, Rob. We will do that. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and taking a few extra minutes at the end. Thanks to Julian Agamon for uh, sharing his thoughts and, and scholarship and work in the areas of just sustainability. For those of you uh, we'd love to see you that aren't an Eco Districts uh, accredited professional, we'd encourage you to do so uh, to learn more about our work and uh, the protocol and our certification. Um, please see us at ecodistricts.org uh, and contact either Teva or myself. Thanks again, Julian, and we'll see you uh, next time for our uh, Wednesday webinar series. Bye now.